Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time you find yourself watching this video. I pray that you have had a blessed day. Welcome back to Jesus in the Center. My name is Ebony, and today we will be diving into day 29 of our Bible in a Year reading plan. So in today's reading, we are going to be covering Leviticus chapters 11 through 15. So let's jump into the word of God. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, give the following instructions to the people of Israel. Of all the land animals, these are the ones you may use for food. You may eat any animal that has completely split hooves and choose the cud. You may not, however, eat the following animals that have split hooves or that chew the cud, but not both. The camel chews the cud, but does not have split hooves, so it is ceremonially unclean for you. The hyrax chews the cud, but does not have split hooves, so it is unclean. The hare chews the cud, but does not have split hooves, so it is unclean. The pig has evenly split hooves, but does not chew the cud, so it is unclean. You may not eat the meat of these animals or even touch their carcasses. They are ceremonially unclean for you. Of all the marine animals, these are the ones you may use for food. You may eat anything from the water if it has both fins and scales, whether taken from salt water or from streams. But you must never eat animals from the sea or from rivers that do not have both fins and scales. They are detestable to you. This applies both to little creatures that live in shallow water and to all creatures that live in deep water. They will always be detestable to you. You must never eat their meat or even touch their dead bodies. Any marine animal that does not have both fins and scales is detestable to you. These are the birds that are detestable to you. You must never eat them. The griffin vulture, the bearded vulture, the black vulture, the kite, falcons of all kinds, ravens of all kinds, the eagle owl, the short-eared owl, the seagull, hawks of all kinds, the little owl, the cormorant, the great owl, the barn owl, the desert owl, the Egyptian vulture, the stork, herons of all kinds, the Hopi, and the bat. You must not eat winged insects that walk along the ground. They are detestable to you. You may, however, eat winged insects that walk along the ground and have jointed legs so they can jump. The insects you are permitted to eat include all kinds of locusts, bald locusts, crickets, and grasshoppers. All other winged insects that walk along the ground are detestable to you. The following creatures will make you ceremonially unclean. If any of you touch their carcasses, you will be defiled until evening. If you pick up their carcasses, you must wash your clothes and you will remain defiled until evening. Any animal that has split hooves that are not evenly divided or that does not chew the cud is unclean for you. If you touch the carcass of such an animal, you will be defiled. Of the animals that walk on all fours, those that have paws are unclean. If you touch the carcass of such an animal, you will be defiled until evening. If you pick up its carcass, you must wash your clothes and you will remain defiled until evening. These animals are unclean for you. Of the small animals that scurry along the ground, these are unclean for you. The mole rat, the rat, large lizards of any kind, the gecko, the monitor lizard, the common lizard, the sand lizard, and the chameleon. All these small animals are unclean for you. If any of you touch the dead body of such an animal, you will be defiled until evening. If such an animal dies and falls on something, that object will be unclean. This is true whether the object is made of wood, cloth, leather, or burlap. Whatever its use, you must dip it in water and it will remain defiled until evening. After that, it will be ceremonially clean and may be used again. If such an animal falls into a clay pot, everything in the pot will be defiled and the pot must be smashed. If the water from such a container spills on any food, the food will be defiled and any beverage in such a container will be defiled. Any object on which the carcass of such an animal falls will be defiled. If it is an oven or a hearth, it must be destroyed, for it is defiled and you must treat it accordingly. However, if the carcass of such an animal falls into a spring or a cistern, the water will still be clean. But anyone who touches the carcass will be defiled. If the carcass falls on seed grain to be planted in the field, the seed will still be considered clean. 
But if the seed is wet when the carcass falls on it, the seed will be defiled. If an animal you are permitted to eat dies and you touch its carcass, you will be defiled until evening. If you eat any of its meat or carry away its carcass, you must wash your clothes and you will remain defiled until evening. All small animals that scurry along the ground are detestable and you must never eat them. This includes all animals that slither along on their bellies as well as those with four legs and those with many feet. All such animals that scurry along the ground are detestable and you must never eat them. Do not defile yourselves by touching them. You must not make yourselves ceremonially unclean because of them, for I am the Lord your God. You must consecrate yourselves and be holy because I am holy. So do not defile yourselves with any of these small animals that scurry along the ground. For I, the Lord, am the one who brought you up from the land of Egypt, that I might be your God. Therefore, you must be holy because I am holy. These are the instructions regarding land animals, birds, marine creatures, and animals that scurry along the ground. By these instructions, you will know what is unclean and clean, and which animals may be eaten and which may not be eaten. All right, so that is the end of Leviticus chapter 11. So we see um, God telling the Israelites what animals are clean and which ones are unclean, which ones they can eat, and which ones they are not allowed to eat. So let's see what instructions he leaves for them in chapter 12. The Lord said to Moses, give the following instructions to the people of Israel. If a woman becomes pregnant and gives birth to a son, she will be ceremonially unclean for seven days. Just as she is unclean during her menstrual period. On the eighth day, the boy's foreskin must be circumcised. After waiting 33 days, she will be purified from the bleeding of childbirth. During this time of purification, she must not touch anything that is set apart as holy, and she must not enter the sanctuary until her time of purification is over. If a woman gives birth to a daughter, she will be ceremonially unclean for two weeks, just as she is unclean during her menstrual period. After waiting 66 days, she will be purified from the bleeding of childbirth. When the time of purification is completed for either a son or a daughter, the woman must bring a one-year-old lamb for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or turtle dove for a purification offering. She must bring her offerings to the priest at the entrance of the tabernacle. The priest will then present them to the Lord to purify her. Then she will be ceremonially clean again after her bleeding at childbirth. These are the instructions for a woman after the birth of a son or a daughter. If a woman cannot afford to bring a lamb, she must bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons. One will be for the burnt offering and the other for the purification offering. The priest will sacrifice them to purify her and she will be ceremonially clean. All right, so that is the end of Leviticus chapter 12. So God has given them the regulations for women after childbirth and what they are to do and whether or not the woman is ceremonially clean or unclean during this time. All right, let's see what he says in Leviticus chapter 13. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, if anyone has a swelling or a rash or discolored skin that might develop into a serious skin disease, that person must be brought to Aaron, the priest, or to one of his sons. The priest will examine the affected area of the skin. If the hair in the affected area has turned white and the problem appears to be more than skin deep, it is a serious skin disease and the priest who examines it must pronounce the person ceremonially unclean. But if the affected area of the skin is only a white discoloration and does not appear to be more than skin deep, and if the hair on the spot has not turned white, the priest will quarantine the person for seven days. On the seventh day, the priest will make another examination. If he finds the affected area has not changed and the problem has not spread on the skin, the priest will quarantine the person for seven more days. On the seventh day, the priest will make another examination. If he finds the affected area has faded and has not spread, the priest will pronounce the person ceremonially clean. It was only a rash. The person's clothing must be washed and the person will be ceremonially clean. But if the rash continues to spread after the person has been examined by the priest and has been pronounced clean, the infected person must return to be examined again. If the priest finds that the rash has spread, he must pronounce the person ceremonially unclean, 
for it is indeed a skin disease. Anyone who develops a serious skin disease must go to the priest for examination. If the priest finds a white swelling on the skin and some hair on the spot has turned white and there is an open sore in the affected area, it is a chronic skin disease and the priest must pronounce the person ceremonially unclean. In such cases, the person need not be quarantined, for it is obvious that the skin is defiled by disease. Now suppose the disease has spread all over the person's skin, covering the body from head to foot. When the priest examines the infected person and finds that the disease covers the entire body, he will pronounce the person ceremonially clean. Since the skin has turned completely white, the person is clean. But if any open sores appear, the infected person will be pronounced ceremonially unclean. The priest must make this pronouncement as soon as he sees an open sore, since open sores indicate the presence of a skin disease. However, if the open sores heal and turn white like the rest of the skin, the person must return to the priest for another examination. If the affected areas have indeed turned white, the priest will then pronounce the person ceremonially clean by declaring, you are clean. If anyone has a boil on the skin that has started to heal, but a white swelling or a reddish white spot develops in its place, that person must go to the priest to be examined. If the priest examines it and finds it to be more than skin deep, and if the hair in the affected area has turned white, the priest must pronounce the person ceremonially unclean. The boil has become a serious skin disease. But if the priest finds no white hair on the affected area and the problem appears to be no more than skin deep and has faded, the priest must quarantine the person for seven days. If during that time the affected area spreads on the skin, the priest must pronounce the person ceremonially unclean because it is a serious disease. But if the area grows no larger and does not spread, it is merely the scar from the boil and the priest will pronounce the person ceremonially clean. If anyone has suffered a burn on the skin and the burn area changes color, becoming either reddish white or shiny white, the priest must examine it. If he finds that the hair in the affected area has turned white and the problem appears to be more than skin deep, a skin disease has broken out in the burn. The priest must then pronounce the person ceremonially unclean, for it is clearly a serious skin disease. But if the priest finds no white hair on the affected area and the problem appears to be no more than skin deep and has faded, the priest must quarantine the infected person for seven days. On the seventh day, the priest must examine the person again. If the affected area has spread on the skin, the priest must pronounce that person ceremonially unclean, for it is clearly a serious skin disease. But if the affected area has not changed or spread on the skin and has faded, It is simply a swelling from the burn. The priest will then pronounce the person ceremonially clean, for it is only the scar from the burn. If anyone, either a man or woman, has a sore on the head or chin, the priest must examine it. If he finds it is more than skin deep and has fine yellow hair on it, the priest must pronounce the person ceremonially unclean. It is a scabby sore of the head or chin. If the priest examines the scabby sore and finds that it is only skin deep, but there is no black hair on it, he must quarantine the person for seven days. On the seventh day, the priest must examine the sore again. If he finds that the scabby sore has not spread and there is no yellow hair on it, and it appears to be only skin deep, the person must shave off all hair except the hair on the affected area. Then the priest must quarantine the person for another seven days. On the seventh day, he will examine the sore again. If it has not spread and appears to be no more than skin deep, the priest will pronounce the person ceremonially clean. The person's clothing must be washed and the person will be ceremonially clean. But if the scabby sore begins to spread after the person is pronounced clean, the priest must do another examination. If he finds that the sore has spread, the priest does not need to look for yellow hair. The infected person is ceremonially unclean. But if the color of the scabby sore does not change and black hair has grown on it, it has healed. The priest will then pronounce the person ceremonially clean. If anyone, either a man or a woman, has shiny white patches on the skin, the priest must examine the affected area. If he finds that the shiny patches are only pale white, 
This is a harmless skin rash and the person is ceremonially clean. If a man loses his hair and his head becomes bald, he is ceremonially clean. And if he loses hair on his forehead, he simply has a bald forehead, he is still clean. However, if a reddish white sore appears on the bald area on top of his head or on his forehead, this is a skin disease. The priest must examine him, and if he finds swelling around the red, reddish white sore anywhere on the man's head, and it looks like a skin disease, the man is indeed infected with a skin disease and is unclean. The priest must pronounce him ceremonially unclean because of the sore on his head. Those who suffer from a serious skin disease must tear their clothing and leave their hair uncombed. They must cover their mouth and call out, unclean, unclean. As long as the serious disease lasts, they will be ceremonially unclean. They must live in isolation in their place outside the camp. Now suppose mildew contaminates some woolen or linen clothing, woolen or linen fabric, the hide of an animal or anything made of leather. If the contaminated area in the clothing, the animal hide, the fabric, or the leather article has turned greenish or reddish, it is contaminated with mildew and must be shown to the priest. After examining the affected spot, the priest will put the article in quarantine for seven days. On the seventh day, the priest must inspect it again. If the contaminated area has spread, the clothing or fabric or leather is clearly contaminated by a serious mildew and is ceremonially unclean. The priest must burn the item, the clothing, the woolen or linen fabric, or a piece of leather, for it has been contaminated by a serious mildew, it must be completely destroyed by fire. But if the priest examines it and finds that the contaminated area has not spread in the clothing, the fabric, or the leather, the priest will order the object to be washed and then quarantined for seven more days. Then the priest must examine the object again. If he finds that the contaminated area has not changed color after being washed, even if it did not spread, the object is defiled. It must be completely burned up, whether the contaminated spot is on the inside or outside. But if the priest examines it and finds that the contaminated area has faded after being washed, he must cut the spot from the clothing, the fabric, or the leather. If the spot later reappears on the clothing, the fabric, or the leather article, the mildew is clearly spreading and the contaminated object must be burned up. But if the spot disappears from the clothing, the fabric, or the leather article after it has been washed, it must be washed again, then it will be ceremonially clean. These are the instructions for dealing with mildew that contaminates woolen or linen clothing or fabric or anything made of leather. This is how the priest will determine whether these items are ceremonially clean or unclean. All right, so chapter 13 continues on with God's instructions for how to determine what is ceremonially clean and unclean. So let's continue on to chapter 14. And the Lord said to Moses, the following instructions are for those seeking ceremonial purification from a skin disease. Those who have been healed must be brought to the priest who will examine them at a place outside the camp. If the priest finds that someone has been healed of a serious skin disease, he will perform a purification ceremony using two live birds that are ceremonially clean, a stick of cedar, some scarlet yarn, and a hyssop branch. The priest will order that one bird be slaughtered over a clay pot filled with fresh water. He will take the live bird, the cedar stick, the scarlet yarn, and the hyssop branch and dip them into the blood of the bird that was slaughtered over the fresh water. The priest will then sprinkle the blood of the dead bird seven times on the person being purified of the skin disease. When the priest has purified the person, he will release the live bird in the open field to fly away. The person being purified must then wash their clothes, shave off all their hair, and bathe themselves in water. Then they will be ceremonially clean and may return to the camp. However, they must remain outside their tents for seven days. On the seventh day, they must again shave all the hair from their heads, including the hair of the beard and eyebrows. They must also wash their clothes and bathe themselves in water. Then they will be ceremonially clean. On the eighth day, each person being purified must bring two male lambs and a one-year-old female lamb, all with no defects, along with a grain offering of six quarts of choice flour moistened with olive oil and a cup of olive oil. 
Then the officiating priest will present the person for purification along with the offerings before the Lord at the entrance of the tabernacle. The priest will take one of the male lambs and the olive oil and present them as a guilt offering, lifting them up as a special offering before the Lord. He will then slaughter the male lamb in the sacred area where sin offerings and burnt offerings are slaughtered. As with the sin offering, the guilt offering belongs to the priest. It is a most holy offering. The priest will then take some of the blood of the guilt offering and apply it to the lobe of the right ear, the thumb of the right hand, and the big toe of the right foot of the person being purified. Then the priest will pour some of the olive oil into the palm of his own left hand. He will dip his right finger into the oil in his palm and sprinkle some of it with his finger seven times before the Lord. The priest will then apply some of the oil in his palm over the blood from the guilt offering that is on the lobe of the right ear, the thumb of the right hand, and the big toe of the right foot of the person being purified. The priest will apply the oil remaining in his hand to the head of the person being purified. Through this process, the priest will purify the person before the Lord. Then the priest must present the sin offering to purify the person who was cured of the skin disease. After that, the priest will slaughter the burnt offering and offer it on the altar along with the grain offering. Through this process, the priest will purify the person who was healed, and the person will be ceremonially clean. But anyone who is too poor and cannot afford these offerings may bring one male lamb for a guilt offering to be lifted up as a special offering for purification. The person must also bring two quarts of choice flour moistened with olive oil for the grain offering and a cup of olive oil. The offering must also include two turtle doves or two young pigeons, whichever the person can afford. One of the pair must be used for the sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. On the eighth day of the purification ceremony, the person being purified must bring the offerings to the priests in the Lord's presence at the entrance of the tabernacle. The priest will take the lamb for the guilt offering along with the olive oil and lift them up as a special offering to the Lord. Then the priest will slaughter the lamb for the guilt offering. He will take some of its blood and apply it to the lobe of the right ear, the thumb of the right hand, and the big toe of the right foot of the person being purified. The priest will also pour some of the olive oil into the palm of his own left hand. He will dip his right finger into the oil in his palm and sprinkle some of it seven times before the Lord. The priest will then apply some of the oil in his palm over the blood from the guilt offering. That is on the lobe of the right ear, the thumb of the right hand, and the big toe of the right foot of the person being purified. The priest will apply the oil remaining in his hand to the head of the person being purified. Through this process, the priest will purify the person before the Lord. Then the priest will offer the two turtle doves or the two young pigeons, whichever the person can afford. One of them is for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering to be presented along with the grain offering. Through this process, the priest will purify the person before the Lord. These are the instructions for purification for those who have recovered from a serious skin disease, but who cannot afford to bring the offerings normally required for the ceremony of purification. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, When you arrive in Canaan, the land I am giving you as your own possession, I may contaminate some of the houses in your land with mildew. The owner of such a house must then go to the priest and say, It appears that my house has some kind of mildew. Before the priest goes in to inspect the house, he must have the house empty, so nothing inside will be pronounced ceremonially unclean. Then the priest will go in and examine the mildew on the walls. If he finds greenish or reddish streaks and the contamination appears to go deeper than the wall's surface, the priest will step outside the door and put the house in quarantine for seven days. On the seventh day, the priest must return for another inspection. If he finds that the mildew on the walls of the house has spread, the priest must order that the stones from those areas be removed. The contaminated material will then be taken outside the town to an area designated as ceremonially unclean. Next, the inside walls of the entire house must be scraped thoroughly and the scrapings dumped in the unclean place outside the town. Other stones will be brought in to replace the ones that were removed, and the walls will be replastered. 
But if the mildew reappears after all the stones have been replaced and the house has been scraped and replastered, the priest must return and inspect the house again. If he finds that the mildew has spread, the walls are clearly contaminated with a serious mildew and the house is defiled. It must be torn down and all its stones, timbers, and plaster must be carried out of town to the place designated as ceremonially unclean. Those who enter the house during the period of, the, of quarantine will be ceremonially unclean until evening, and all who sleep or eat in the house must wash their clothing. But if the priest returns for his inspection and finds that the mildew has not reappeared in the house after the fresh plastering, he will pronounce it clean because the mildew is clearly gone. To purify the house, the priest must take two birds, a stick of cedar, some scarlet yarn, and a hyssop branch. He will slaughter one of the birds over a clay pot filled with fresh water. He will take the cedar stick, the hyssop branch, the scarlet yarn, and the live bird and dip them into the blood of the slaughtered bird and into the fresh water. Then he will sprinkle the house seven times. When the priest has purified the house in exactly this way, he will release the live bird in the open fields outside the town. Through this process, the priest will purify the house and it will be ceremonially clean. These are the instructions for dealing with serious skin diseases, including scabby sores and mildew, whether on clothing or in a house, and a swelling on the skin, a rash or discolored skin. This procedure will determine whether a person or object is ceremonially clean or unclean. These are the instructions regarding skin diseases and mildew. Amen. So at the end of chapter 14, we see God giving them instructions on how to determine clean and unclean skin conditions as well as how to deal with mildew problems inside of houses and how to purify those um, and how to purify those things. So let's go to our last chapter for today, which is chapter 15. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, give the following instructions to the people of Israel. Any man who has a bodily discharge is ceremonially unclean. This defilement is caused by his discharge whether the discharge continues or stops. In either case, the man is unclean. Any bed on which the man with the discharge lies and anything on which he sits will be ceremonially unclean. So if you touch the man's bed, you must wash your clothes and bathe yourself in water and you will remain unclean until evening. If you sit where the man with the discharge has sat, you must wash your clothes and bathe yourself in water and you will remain unclean until evening. If you touch the man with the discharge, you must wash your clothes and bathe yourself in water, and you will remain unclean until evening. If the man spits on you, you must wash your clothes and bathe yourself in water, and you will remain unclean until evening. Any saddle blanket on which the man rides will be ceremonially unclean. If you touch anything that was under the man, you will be unclean until evening. You must wash your clothes and bathe yourself in water, and you will remain unclean until evening. If the man touches you without first rinsing his hands, you must wash your clothes and bathe yourself in water, and you will remain unclean until evening. Any clay pot the man touches must be broken, and any wooden utensil he touches must be rinsed with water. When the man with the discharge is healed, he must count off seven days for the period of purification. Then he must wash his clothes and bathe himself in fresh water, and he will be ceremonially clean. On the eighth day, he must get two turtle doves or two young pigeons and come before the Lord at the entrance of the tabernacle and give his offerings to the priest. The priest will offer one bird for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. Through this process, the priest will purify the man before the Lord for his discharge. Whenever a man has an omission of semen, he must bathe his entire body in water and he will remain ceremonially unclean until the next evening. Any clothing or leather with semen on it must be washed in water and it will remain unclean until evening. After a man and a woman have sexual intercourse, they must each bathe in water and they will remain unclean until the next evening. Whenever a woman has her menstrual period, she will be ceremonially unclean for seven days. Anyone who touches her during that time will be unclean until evening. Anything on which the woman lies or sits during the time of her period will be unclean. If any of you touch her bed, you must wash your clothes and bathe yourself in water, and you will remain unclean until evening. If you touch any object, 
she has sat on, you must wash your clothes and bathe yourself in water, and you will remain unclean until evening. This includes her bed or any other object she has sat on. You will be unclean until evening if you touch it. If a man has sexual intercourse with her and her blood touches him, her menstrual impurity will be transmitted to him. He will remain unclean for seven days and any bed on which he lies will be unclean. If a woman has a flow of blood for many days that is unrelated to her menstrual period, or if the blood continues beyond the normal period, she is ceremonially unclean. As during her menstrual period, the woman will be unclean as long as the discharge continues. Any bed she lies on and any object she sits on during that time will be unclean, just as during her normal menstrual period. If any of you touch these things, you will be ceremonially unclean. You must wash your clothes and bathe yourself in water, and you will remain unclean until evening. When the woman's bleeding stops, she must count off seven days, then she will be ceremonially clean. On the eighth day, she must bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons and present them to the priest at the entrance of the tabernacle. The priest will offer one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. Through this process, the priest will purify her before the Lord for the ceremonial impurity caused by her bleeding. This is how you will guard the people of Israel from ceremonial uncleanliness. Otherwise, they would die, for their impurity would defile my tabernacle that stands among them. These are the instructions for dealing with anyone who has a bodily discharge, a man who is unclean because of an emission of semen or a woman during her menstrual period. It applies to any man or woman who has a bodily discharge and to a man who has sexual intercourse with a woman who is ceremonially unclean. So that is the end of chapter 15. As you can see, God left no stone unturned when it came to deciding what was ceremonially clean and what was ceremonially unclean. He even went down to um, sexual intercourse and you being unclean after sexual intercourse. So he covered everything. But all right, that is the end of day 29 of our Bible in a Year reading plan. I hope that you found this reading interesting and that you were blessed by it. If you have not downloaded this week's reflection questions, they will be in the description area of the video. You can click on the link and download the reflection questions for this week. If you have not liked or subscribe to the channel yet, make sure you hit that like button and hit that bell notification so that you can get the notifications for our next video. But all right, I pray that you have an amazing day and I will see you back tomorrow for day 30 of our Bible in a Year reading plan. Bye.